In this video, we introduce detection with vector valued observations. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that in this video, this all might seem a little bit abstract, and um, you might be wondering why we need this material. And the reason is as we get to working with real data sets where we have several measurements rather than just one measurement, we really do need to think about our measurement as a vector. Okay, so in this video, we're just gonna introduce that framework work out a simple example, and just know that in most cases, we'll be working with this framework with real data. As before, there are two hypotheses. We're going to call them H0 and H1, just like before. And the measurement or observation that we get will now consist of n random variables. Okay, so I get n different measurements that I'm going to use to decide, and I'm going to organize them into a random vector y with this bar underneath. So I just have y1 down to yn, that's my vector. In the discrete case, this vector has a PMF under h0 and under h1. And in the um, continuous case, it has conditional PDFs under h0 and under h1. Okay, so it's the same as before, except it's conditional PMFs and conditional PDFs for vectors. We have a detector or decision rule that takes in this vector and it outputs zero if it thinks that H0 occurred, and outputs one if it thinks that H1 occurred, using only this vector as information. This naturally partitions the range of the vector into decision regions A0, where I'm deciding zero, and A1, where I'm deciding one. And finally, the probability of error is the thing we're interested in working with. So that's the false alarm probability weighted by the probability of H0 plus the missed detection probability weighted by probability of H1. False alarm is when I decide A1 even though it's H0. Missed detection is I decide A0 even though it's H1. Okay, um, so that's false alarm and missed detection. Now, it's going to be simpler to work with a likelihood ratio throughout. So we're just going to define that as before. The ratio of probability of h1 under over probability of h0 either in the discrete case or the continuous case okay so we're going to get the same maximum likelihood or ml decision rule that we had with the likelihood ratio in the previous video okay so except now instead of l of a scalar i have l of a vector but otherwise everything is the same i compare to one as a threshold or zero if i'm working with the log likelihood ratio uh, which is sometimes more convenient. For the map rule, it's again the same thing, except now I use a weighted threshold that um, uses the uh, hypothesis probabilities, which I need to know in advance, right? So I'm either comparing to probability of H0 over probability of H1, or if I take the log of both sides, because that's more convenient for me, maybe I end up comparing the log of probability of H0 over probability of H1. But this is all the same as we saw with the likelihood ratio. As before, the map rule is going to be um, the best thing you can do. It minimizes the probability of error, okay? It requires knowledge of the hypothesis probabilities, as you can see by that threshold. The map rule is equivalent to the ML rule only when the hypotheses are equally likely, so they both have probability one half. When that's true, ML and map are the same thing because one half divided by one half is one, so the thresholds here are the same. So I'm now gonna work out an example to try to give you some geometry for what these vector decision rules look like. So we'll say that I either have a Gaussian vector with mean mu zero or a Gaussian vector with mean mu one under either hypothesis. So the first vector is minus one, minus one, and the second one is plus one, plus one, but these could really be anything you wanted. So this analysis is not really sensitive to those values. Um, what we're gonna arrive at, you would get for any vectors that you pick here. And I'll say what that means at the very end. Let's say that the covariance matrix is just the identity to make it simple. And the hypothesis probabilities are just one half, one half. And what we wanna do is determine the optimal decision rule. Okay, so um, now we have enough information to proceed. So what is the optimal decision rule if just on the previous slide, we said that since the hypothesis probabilities are the same, 
It doesn't really matter whether we use the map rule or the ML rule, they're both going to do the same thing. The map rule obviously is optimal, but since um, the hypothesis probabilities are the same, we could just work out the ML rule, which is usually a little bit easier. So um, we're gonna start out by working out the likelihood ratio, okay? To do that, I'm going to explicitly work out the conditional PDFs in each case on this slide. So I'm gonna have the probability of um, density of Y given H0, which I first have this constant term, which is two pi squared times the determinant of the covariance matrix of Y. Probably you had to look that up. Um, minus one half times Y vector minus the mean vector transpose times the covariance matrix inverse times Y vector minus mu vector. And remember, y vector is just y1 and y2. It's just a length two vector because all of these mean vectors and covariance matrices are size two or for the matrix two by two. So we know that they're just two observations. And for this uh, conditional PDF, it's totally fine if you need to go and look it up. I'm just giving it to you at the outset. And I'm going to work out what this looks like by kind of simplifying out of these vectors. So first here, I have this transpose vector. So I have y1 minus the mean value, which is minus 1, and y2 minus the mean value, minus 1. Then I have the inverse of identity, which is identity, then y1 minus minus 1, and y2 minus minus 1. Okay, so I've opened up all these vectors and matrices so I can see what's happening. And now I'm going to just go through with this multiplication. It's pretty simple in this case. I get y1 plus 1 squared plus y2 plus 1 squared. Okay, and I'm going to see a very similar calculation when I work out the conditional probability under h1. Okay, so the constant in front is going to be exactly the same, all right? And I'm going to have x minus 1 half y vector minus mu 1 vector transpose times the inverse covariance matrix y vector minus mu 1 vector this is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi x minus 1 half times y1 minus plus 1, y2 minus plus 1 as a row vector because we took the transpose. The inverse of identity is just identity. And then y1 minus plus 1, y2 minus plus 1 as a column vector. Okay, and again, it's simple to work out. In this case, I'm just going to get the same thing except instead of y1 uh, for plus 1, we're going to have y1 minus 1 squared plus y2 minus 1 squared, and that's going to be our expressions. Okay, so from here, we're ready to work out this likelihood ratio. So let's just move these to the top, and we're going to work out the likelihood ratio. So that's just going to be f of y given h1 over f of y vector given h0, and we have those expressions up there. So the likelihood ratio is really just the h1 likelihood over the h0 likelihood. And so I'm just going to write these out exactly as they are above, and I'm going to be looking to cancel out terms. And there are a lot of terms we're going to cancel, and I can see that by expanding these squares. Okay, So the terms that are going to cancel are basically going to be the squared terms and the constant terms. Okay, So I had y1 uh, plus 1 squared and y2 plus 1 squared on the top, which I expanded. And here I have y1 minus 1 squared and plus y2 minus 1 squared, which I expanded. I'm just knocking out all of these terms so they're the same. I end up with x of 2y1 plus y2, which is pretty simple given what we started with. So the ML rule, which is the same as the map rule in this case, is just comparing this likelihood ratio to 1. Okay, so let's do that. Let's write that out. I'm going to plug in this likelihood ratio. It's x 2y1 plus y2 compared to 1. Okay, so when it's greater than or equal to 1, I decide 1, otherwise 0. And it turns out this is just when y1 plus y2 is greater than or equal to 0, I decide 1, and otherwise I decide 0. Now why is that? Well, when is e to the something 1? It's when it's e to the 0. So really, I'm just checking when y1 um, uh, plus y2 is above or below 0. That's when e to the something is above or below 1. Okay, let's look at this as a picture to see what's going on. Here's the mu1 vector and the mu0 vector. Remember, mu1 was plus 1 plus 1 and mu0 was minus 1 minus 1. And what I'm drawing here is the line y1 plus y2 is equal to 0. And above this line, that's where I'm deciding h1. And below this line, that's where I'm deciding h0. 
That's what my decision rule came down to. And intuitively, what the um, ML rule has done in this case, in this example, is pick the hypothesis whose mean vector is closest to the observed vector. And that makes intuitive sense. That's like a geometric idea. And it turns out that due to the special structure of Gaussian noise with an identity matrix for the covariance matrix, this is always what happens. So even if I had different mean vectors, wherever you want to put them, the decision rule, if you had Gaussian mean vector and then identity for covariance matrix, it would always come down to choose the closest vector, which is a nice intuitive um, strategy. So the probability of error in this case, we're not going to work it out, but you could work it out using the following fact. Y1 plus Y2 is itself Gaussian under both H0 and H1 because it's a linear function of Gaussians or a linear transform of a Gaussian vector. So you could work out the parameters of the Gaussian y1 plus y2, and then you could figure out when is it above zero with what probability and when is it below zero with what probability, and that would be the probability of error. But we're not going to do that here. As I said, we're going to be more interested in using these vector calculations when we're working with big data sets rather than um, pen and paper calculations.